I've just arrived at Stuart's house in deeper Surrey. It's, uh, it's out, out in the countryside, in a secret location. Um, so here we go. I'm actually blindfolded, so you have to bear with me. Stuart, are you there? Okay, right, I just, uh, could you help me take off the blindfold? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now, okay. Yeah, I can, thank you very much. Okay. Right, now I, better, now I can see, I better take the blindfold off the camera. Focus, focus, okay. Stuart. Straight to business, how are you? I'm alright John, how are you? Not too bad, thank you very much. Now what the hell is that? This is called a Sony BVH-2000. This is a television broadcast C format, one inch video recorder. It uses one inch wide tape. It was present as a format in television from 1979 to 1991. This machine was made in 1985 and cost at the time around £85,000 a very nice family home during that period, I believe. Um, it's very high quality, it's an analogue machine. It was used for all television recording and post-production, editing and transmission. And if you ever rented out VHS cassettes during the 80s, which I'm sure you did, all the masters for those VHS cassettes were at one time existed on these machines, on this format. It's very high quality indeed. Um, they have to be laced manually, so um, we're now going to, I'll take you through basically how you load up a tape, how you lace it up, and then how you line it up each time you loaded each and every tape on one of these machines. They had to be individually lined up and calibrated for replay on that particular machine. This is a one inch C format videotape, currently in a transit container, which is flame retardant to protect it during transport and handling. And hopefully what we're going to do is going to take this tape out now, we're going to lace it up and run it on the machine that you just saw. Undo the catch, lift the lid, and you'll see inside it is the spool of tape. This tape, this spool runs for 60 minutes. You can get varying lengths of one inch tape. The smallest is 30 minutes, this is an interim size, 60 minutes. You can get two hour, sorry, you get 90 minutes, two hour, 120 minutes, and on extremely large spools, three hour, 180 minutes, although they weren't commonly used. Now these spools of tape are quite, they're quite physically heavy, and to handle them, the machine's motors have very, very high torque. So you can't just put them on the machine, they have to be locked onto the machine, which these are for. These are, the small halves, which you can see, are very, very substantial. The motors are extremely powerful um, and there are locks on the top. So to load a spool, physically first of all we get the spool, put it onto the hub and we lock it like that. And it won't come off, otherwise there would be a danger of it flying off when the machine started to operate. So now we have to lace up the tape to make it run. So first of all we open the front of the machine, the front cover see the various principal transport components in the machine. You have entry and exit guides there. And this big drum here, this rotates, that carries the video heads. There are three video heads on that drum, which record and replay the video information from the tape. Uh, that drum runs at 3000 RPM. Now if you're any good at maths, which I'm not, that equates to 50 times a second. The other reason that the heads spin on these machines is to get the bandwidth up. Whereas an audio recorder records frequency, a frequency range of around 20 hertz, that's 20 cycles per second, up to 20 kilohertz, which is 20,000 cycles a second, which is roughly what human beings hear. Video signals occupy a much wider bandwidth. A video signal, a video recorder must be capable in the analog world of recording from zero hertz up to five megahertz, that's five million cycles, around 10 octaves or 10 doubling frequency, 10 doublings of frequencies. 
this requires an extremely high tape speed. So rather than run the tape at around 800, 800 inches a second past the head, which you would have to do to achieve that kind of frequency response, you run the tape slowly and spin the head past the tape. This is the principle on which all analog, domestic and professional video recorders worked. So now what I'm going to do is lace up the tape around the tape path and start the machine and see what we have to do. We pull off an amount of tape from the supply spool and we lace it through the mechanism. I'm going to, so as you can see what I'm doing, I'm going to try and attempt to do it working from this angle, which is a bit tricky. We'll see how we go. Through the entry guides, through the entrance guide to the scanner, round the scanner, out of the scanner. Through this assembly here, this assembly here picks up the audio information, the sound from the tape, round the exit guide, onto the take up spool. You don't do it the lazy way and pull the end of the tape out, you must make the end of the tape tuck round the spool, hub like that, and you make a grip. There must be no bumps, chinks in the tape. So there we go, that's now the machine laced. Check that the scanner runs freely before we start the machine up. Now to play the tape, the first thing we have to do is spin the scanner up to speed. We do that by pressing a button down here. Two things happen there. The tape tension is automatically taken up by the machine and the scanner is spun, spun up to speed. That's now running at 50 Hz, 50 RPS, 3000 RPM, quite fast. You don't want to catch anything in that, clothes, hands, ties if you will. So they provide a cover. At the moment, the machine is giving no picture at all. If I press play, it's still giving no picture. That's because there's nothing recorded at the moment on this part of the tape. So what I'm going to do is fast forward a little way into the tape to what's called the lineup or the test signals. They're used for calibrating the replay of the tape to the machine. So I'm going to shuffle in, turn this knob here. We can vary the speed of fast forward and rewind and there we see some colour bars. Now you'll see, the first thing you'll notice, if you're familiar with VHS, which I'm sure some of you were, the still frames from these machines are very, very good indeed. They use a very, very sophisticated mechanism um, to achieve this called auto-scan tracking, which enables trick play functions, things like slow-mo um, and pictures and shuttle and rewind, some of which I'll show you later on. But now, what we, what we want to talk about now is line-up and replay of this tape. So the first thing we want to do is set the machine's tracking. Now, you'll remember from VHS days or Betamax days, whatever you used, the machines usually had a tracking control in the early days. Later on, the machines would manually track. Sorry, would automatically track rather than you put the tape in and you might put up a little display which said tracking. All that meant was that the machine has to optimally, that the head on the machine must optimally follow each of the recorded tracks on the tape. On a domestic machine, you simply adjusted it for the picture to look good. On a professional machine, that's not accurate enough. We have to look at what's recorded on the tape and then optimise the machine's replay. Unfortunately, the machine is equipped with various oscilloscopes. You see up here, waveform monitors, oscilloscopes. These are the video and television equivalent of VU meters on your cassette deck or your reel-to-reel -reel deck. They, they, they show for vision what the needles show for sound. So the first thing we want to do is look at the appropriate waveform. We want to look at the RF leaving the tape, which we can do with these selected items here. So, if I now go to RF envelope, that's the RF leaving the tape. If I now change the replay head, Press play. The tracking control on these machines is down here. I'm going to put it in, I'm going to pull it out to activate it. And you see as I adjust it, you'll see that waveform increasing and decreasing in amplitude. Now if I go right the wrong way, can you see, you'll probably notice the replay is quite compromised. You see the noise appearing on the colour bars there. Go the other way, we can do the same. There we are. So that's not good. What we do is we adjust it for the maximum size of that waveform. So down, up, down, up. We find the point where it is at its maximum. We 
which is there. That machine is now optimally tracked. OK, we're now going to line up the machine for optimal vision replay. There are four principal adjustments in this process. There's black level, there's video level, there's chroma level, which is colour level, and there's chroma phase, which is the way the machine decodes the chroma information that's recorded on tape. They're all very, very critical. Colour bars allow you to set all of those parameters very, very easily, which is why we use the signal in the first place as a line-up. And these oscilloscopes here allow us to see all the parameters, so I'm going to take you through now how we go through and do a standard line-up. So first off, put the machine into play. Black level is the first adjustment. Black level control is here. As I adjust it, if you look up at the top scope, you see it going up, going down. And what I want to do is I want to set the black level, which is there, on the naught volt line, which is there. That's correctly lined up. The next is the video level, which is the peak white signal there, the equivalent to that signal on the left. If you see if I turn it up, that's high, that's low. As interesting aside, you'll see the picture on the monitor varying in brightness there, because we're adjusting what's called the gain of the video signal. It's the equivalent to the contrast on your TV, actually. It's the same thing. In the professional field, we don't do it by subjective, we, we can't do it subjectively, we have to know the level. The level in this case is 0.7 of a volt, or 700 millivolts. Having done that, I want to set the colour level. Now the colour level is set by setting the, th the green bar, which is the, that's the yellow and cyan, the green bar is the third colour bar in there, to put that on the black, on the same level as the black. So on the chroma level there, you see, I turn it down, that's too low, you see the colour level goes down on the monitor. Vice versa, too high. Green on black. Once we've done the colour level, we can talk about this instrument under here, which generates the funny little dots. This is called a vector scope. It does exactly what its name suggests. It shows the vector it shows vector and scalar quantities of each individual um, piece of chroma information coming off the tape. Now in this instance we've recorded colour bars. Now colour bars have a very, very fixed set of colours. What they are, they're, um, they're the three primaries, red, green and blue, and the three direct complementaries of the primaries, which are yellow, cyan and magenta. And they're represented by these dots here. The amplitude, or the amount of the colour, is shown by how far the dot is up the scale. And the vector quantity, i.e. the position of the dot within the scale, defines what the colour is. So, for instance, that dot there represents the colour red. Round there you've got the colour blue, etc. All the colours there are represented. It's critical, really, for assessing how well a machine is working. If a machine develops a fault, if an analog machine develops a fault, this signal very quickly goes wrong. The dots aren't in the boxes, and then you would perform further diagnostic checks. Um, but this is now a satisfactory lineup. You can probably hear on the speakers there some tone. You're probably familiar with that if you've ever fallen asleep and woken up in front of a test card. That's one kilohertz or one thousand hertz tone used for setting audio level. We do that on a PPM or peak program meter. One of these here. If I I'm going to walk this side. Just the replay. I set that on PPM4. So channel 1, channel 2, PPM4. Okay, so now we've lined up the tape for replay. If we were going to replay this on air, for instance, transmit it on ITV, we would have to have the tape queued at the beginning of the program and what's called pre rolled or rolled back an exact number of seconds so the network director or channel controller would know. Where the, when, the, when the program would start. So the first step to doing that is we'll use the jog function on the machine to find there's the top of the program, you see it fading up there from black. So there we are, so I've just put it there. Put an entry point in the machine by pressing the entry button there. If I now press the pre-roll button, the machine rolls back exactly 10 seconds from that point. I'll prove that now by counting in to run the machine. So I'll go 12, 11, run VT, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Q. And the program starts. That is repeatable, a very important thing to be able to do. 
all broadcast machines are able to do that, all tape machines. Of course, computers can do it very much more accurately now. Back in these days, computers didn't do this, human beings did.